Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, our March uh, joint meeting of uh, the NIPA and uh, Canal uh, trustees. Uh, I'm very pleased to have a full squad turnout uh, today with me, fellow trustees Gonzalez, Warren Wheelock, uh, <coughs> Morris, and Trainer. Uh, I'm Michael Cusick. Sorry, Michael. Didn't mean to drive by you there. Uh, as well as uh, Justin, Adam, Joe, John, Karen, Arabella, others, uh, Lori's here, and uh, many more staff to uh, uh, join us in a bit. And with all of that, um, I'm proud to uh, call this uh, meeting uh, to order. We've all had the opportunity uh, to review a very full and robust agenda. Unless anyone has any amendments there to it, ask for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. We have a second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, we've also had a chance to uh, review uh, the list of contractors, any late breaking conflicts or changes from anyone. Uh, so we have a full uh, agenda, which we'll uh, briefly recap. Uh, but uh, as we typically do, we'll uh, start with a short uh, executive session. So if I could, I'd ask for a motion uh, to conduct an executive session pursuant to section 105 of the public officer's law. Michael, so moved. Second, Lori. All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. We'll uh, be back uh, no more than half an hour, I'm sure. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, if I could have a motion to resume the meeting in open session. Thanks, Dennis. Second, Lori, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? As always, no votes were taken during exec session. Uh, as I said, we have. Uh, a full agenda uh, again today, in addition to our typical updates uh, from Justin, Adam, Alexis, and uh, Joe. Uh, we've got Rebecca and Angeline and Dave here to give us uh, kind of our semi-annual uh, canals update. We last saw them and uh, we're up in Brockport uh, in September. It doesn't seem like six months ago, but yep, uh, in fact, it's uh, six months ago. I think Eve's going to give us a little primer on our Strategy refresh. Uh, Going to be back together in 30 days to kind of kick uh, all of that off. So, uh, got a lot to uh, chat about and uh, cover today. But as always, we'll uh, start with our president and CEO, Justin, giving uh, us uh, an update on the world from uh, his view. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chairman, uh, NIPA management, members of the public. Uh, welcome to our second uh, board meeting of 2024. Uh, it's an exciting time to be here at NIPA, as I think we all internally know. Um, a lot of exciting work ahead of us here. So I, I thought maybe since it's a topic of, 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 of uh, great interest, uh, maybe start off with an update on our expanded authority. Um, so as you know, um, the way we think about what the legislature uh, directed us to do last year and the governor uh, uh, signaled to us her confidence in us and in, in, in uh, performing such an important task, we've divided the expanded authority into basically four, four components. So obviously, first and foremost, NIPA renewables, the REACH program, which we've talked to you about, which everybody's familiar with, our plans to, uh, to uh, transition the Peaker fleet uh, by 2030, also a requirement of the, of the new law. And then finally, the workforce training, which we consider to be the four sort of pillars of the expanded authority. And then finally, uh, additional task given to us last year was what we're calling decarbonization leadership program or DL15. And that's our effort to uh, help the state uh, decarbonize 15 of the top emitters uh, in the state. So today I wanna just um, maybe highlight two of the um, items in the uh, expanded authority, so the renewables and workforce training. So on the renewable side, um, we've made a lot of internal progress uh, since we last briefed you in January. Uh, notably, uh, we've been working closely with McKinsey as I, as I, I previously discussed with you and um, 
they're helping us uh, mature our operating model internally and internal governance around the uh, build out of renewables for the state. And with that support, we're finalizing a uh, target operating model that leverages our strengths in development, ownership, and commercialization to quickly deploy renewable projects for the benefit of the state and its uh, residents. So the operating model is uh, designed to provide flexibility for NYPA to partner with third parties that could hopefully benefit from our unique value proposition, or we could also fully develop projects on our own without partners. And that's part of the process that's underway right now, trying to figure out you know, what, what's the relationship going to be between projects we do in partnership, projects we self-develop, also what, are the, what size are the projects going to be? Are they going to be utility scale projects for the benefit of our customers? Are they going to be projects that we partner in the NYSERDA solicitation? Or are they going to be community-based projects? So all this is uh, underway. We're making a lot of great progress. The, the organization is laser focused on this effort. And like I said, we've got several work streams and task forces underway. But fundamentally, what we're trying to find is what's the NYPA sweet spot? We know, we know what the private sector is doing. We also know that there's been sort of a reset going on in the private sector. What's our role going to be as, as we try to identify gaps and fill those gaps so the state can, can meet its goals? We're also working to finalize our internal uh, governance and controls around this. This is a new line of business for us. We've got to do it right. We've got to do it in the NIPA way. We've got to have strong internal controls, strong governance. And so we're working on that as well. And this will, this will align with NYPA's governance structure and identify opportunities for us to expedite the development of the projects, especially for the early stage projects that we're looking to uh, get rolling on in the project pipeline. We've completed so far uh, high level process maps and studied organizational implications, including our internal resource ramp up. What are we gonna do on resourcing? Are we gonna rely on existing internal NYPA resources? Are we gonna, lean on external support like we sometimes do, probably we'll have some kind of combination of internal resources and external help to get us rolling. It's certainly in the early years as we develop our internal capability to do this work. So our next step is a detailed implementation plan for the operating model. And that work will kick off next week. And one key component of that plan will be the rapid diligence project scorecard that will allow NYPA to quickly vet early stage opportunities and direct our resources to projects most likely to be implementable and implementable quickly. The implement, implementation plan will also mature a customer offering for renewables. So as we know, we've got big footprint uh, governmental customers that will in all likelihood be interested in participating and potentially even being an off taker for some of our projects. So working closely with our customer group and Maribel Cruz, try to identify whether there are customers that would like to be uh, early stage participants with us. And as I also said, we'll be watching closely the NYSERDA solicitation process to see if there are opportunities to partner with, uh, with uh, developers to um, participate in the NYSERDA solicitation. And while we finalize our internal processes, we're in parallel running our RFQ for potential collaborators, and they could be both partners and investors. The RFQ looks for developer or investor so with specific experience in developing or investing in renewables. So we've asked, we're asking questions about their expertise, their team strength, their core business model, their financial strength. What is their, nicer, what is their New York State presence? And what kind of pipeline do they have in existence that where they might even want NYPA participation in a project in their existing pipeline? The RFQ is building on our prior RFI that we talked to you about, where we got over 170 responses, where we asked more broadly about interest in collaborating with NYPA under, and under what structures uh, we'd be able to participate with them in a, and what other wider market opportunities and challenges might be out there. And regarding public engagement, which, which we all know is a key component of the new legislation, the NYPA Renewables page has been updated to include more information and uh, I'll make a public service announcement that can be found at nypa.gov slash renewables. So we're further, we're, we're also beginning our annual conferral process again. And of course, the law requires us and we'll be, we'll be uh, launching several public hearings, at least two public hearings as we roll out uh, the renewables um, 
initiative. And I look forward to coming back to you in May with more detail on renewables. Before you jump. Yeah, I was going to go to workforce training, but I'm happy to take any questions here. There. Yep. So that was a lot. Um, and I guess you're off, you know, done with the script. Uh, so how are we doing? I mean, we're triaging uh, opportunities. We're further vetting potential partners, uh, continuing to gather public input. Um, you feel good about the pace and the rhythm uh, at this point, I mean, it's coming together. McKinsey's help, you know, playing big brother and helping us uh, ensure we're moving this forward, you know, appropriately. Yeah, I mean, I feel great about where we are. It, it'll give you an idea of how we're viewing this uh, this exercise. We've we've uh, we launched two what we were calling sprints, two sprints with McKinsey, and we just finished sprint number two, and uh, that's helped us develop our internal uh, processes mm -hmm. and also start to think about what project structures might look like, where the partnership opportunities might be, what is the industry. You know, look like right now they've got a wealth of information that they bring to us from around the globe, really. So, um, so I think we're, you know, we're, as we've talked to you previously, we're we're staffing up internally with a VP for renewables. She's building out her team. Um, we we have a pretty good sense of uh, what the state, you know, map looks like in terms of where the opportunities for renewables are. And quite frankly, what we've heard from a lot of people is we have an embedded advantage in this process because. Nobody knows the state transmission system better than we do. So there are places where we think potentially we could have projects cited that would take advantage of our existing transmission, you know, footprint. So and I the think partner interest is very strong. Very and strong, very strong. And we'll see, you know, there some are interested in some types of projects uh, and some others. Uh, and I think the way we're looking at it is, as I said earlier, some combination of types of projects, either a project we do you know, merchant with a PP, with PPAs with our governmental customers, projects that we where we compete for a uh, nicer uh, solicitation or nicer to grant uh, with potentially a partner or more customer customer cited projects for the benefit of communities. Because one of the things that we heard through the conferral process is there are a lot of people out there that want to see and feel like they're part of a renewable project where they live. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a challenge, trying to find places, particularly in densely populated areas, where we can deliver a renewable project, whether it's an aggregated, you know, rooftop solar project or some other form of uh, renewables that the community can feel like, hey, you know, I, I'm actually getting my electricity from this, right. Uh, right. From this project that I can sort of see and see and touch. Um, so I think, you know, uh, big picture, I think we're doing doing exactly what we're required to do under the so statute. Please think, with where we are, no, no major surprises, nothing, there's no, like, whoops, we didn't think about that or no aha moments at this point? I don't think so. No, I think one, actually one surprise that we were just talking out in the hall previously is uh, the excitement that we're seeing around the organization to be involved in this. You know, it's, a, it's an opportunity for NIPA to once again, really make a big, make a big uh, yeah. impact on, on the state's, uh, you know, energy uh, infrastructure and footprint. So this is one of those, you know, five or six times when the power authority has been asked to do something big. And so uh, we've got a lot of interest internally around that. Questions from the group, Lori. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Can you talk a little bit about the RFI process, the 170, the review? I'm, you know, seeing the momentum, right? RFI went out and then the RFQ has gone out. So the relationship between the two, I think would be very helpful. Any patterns, you know, is it kind of all over the state, groups we have relationships with and new? Yeah, I think the RFI was, um, as I said, you know, designed to kind of see what interest there was out there and working with us and to kind of get a sense of the landscape and then use that to inform the development of the of the RFQ. So that very much informed uh, how we structured the RFQ, looking for actual, uh, you know, partners and investors so that we can build more, right? The, the more we can, if we do, if we can work with others, we can probably build more than we could on our own. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're super excited about the number of uh, uh, responses we received, and now we're in the process of awaiting responses on the RFQ. So hopefully, we'll be equally, equally, uh, you know, uh, happy with what we get back in that process. And then, um, obviously, all this is in the context of the development of our strategic plan, which we're also 
uh, working on now, and that'll be uh, that'll be socialized probably in the fall. But that's due that's due in the legislature by January 31 of, of 2025, yeah. and that will that's where we'll get really really granular and specific about about what we plan to do at least in these early stages. And you know, this is going to be this is not just for a few years. This is a long term. Um, long-term commitment and challenge and uh, uh, initiative for us. So we'll be watching closely how the state's making out in, in, in achieving its goals and whether the terrain shifts and there are gaps that are created somewhere else where NIPA needs to, um, you know, lean in a little bit differently maybe than we do in the earlier, you know, in the earlier part of this or the earlier years. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I feel like a lot of this will be very fluid. So how are we doing with memorializing like the 170 and tracking that because in five years, maybe something pops back up. Mm -hmm. And so keeping that historical knowledge as we're trying to, you know, build and, and grow. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we've created a whole data set, if you will, from, from this information that we'll, that we'll have uh, access to as we go forward. And it will also be informing our thinking with what we're hearing in the conferral process and through the public hearings and and uh and what we're finding in in terms of the responses to the rfq and and uh changes in the market we'll have to see you know how the how this next nicerta uh you know rebid uh shakes out i understand most of the projects rebid back into nicerta we'll see we'll see if they're able to come you know come to agreement on an on a uh, new relationship i guess after that rebidding but all those things are that's why it's so dynamic yeah. and fluid as you <laughs> said right we're going to have yeah. to really be watching closely a lot of developments thank you any other questions all right great. okay so uh exciting. Yeah. yeah very exciting look forward to it really is the running dialogue so on the workforce training uh, piece, which is another, of course, part of the um, the legislation, the 25 million that we that NIPA repurposed uh, from an existing program for the benefit of workforce training for the clean energy workforce of the future. This is something that um, we're also uh, highly focused on. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention and announce today is we did um, we did execute the uh, memorandum of understanding with the Department of Labor. And so we're um, we're off and running in that partnership. Great. Great. We think that that's going to be great. There could be opportunities for us to um, potentially, you know, work jointly on programs with them, or DOL might do some some of their own programming with that money. On the other hand, NIPA might do some more targeted programming with it. But uh, um, we're going to be coming back to you. I think the plan under the MOU is to come back to you quarterly with um, a list of projects that we're going to be either uh, co-developing or one or the other will be uh, launching. So we'll come back to you regularly uh, for approval, much like we do really on the canal releases, uh, same, kind of, okay. same kind of framework. All right. And we have also, I should mention, we brought on a consultant there as well, CEWD, to help us um, sort of uh, examine the landscape on workforce training, you know, what's working, what's not working, what, where, would, where can NIPA uh and and dol state dol play a role so we brought them on board as well uh if there are no questions on the workforce piece anybody, um, anything on workforce well, a little be? more detail for me you know some of the targets some of the metrics for evaluation what will success look like right just that right. kind of stuff i think success for us will will in the way i think about it anyway is uh, you know how many different groups can we can we touch in this and this is not just a one shot 25 million either this is an annual 25 million commitment by nipa so what, what we've been doing internally and what i've kind of challenged the team to do is to think about think about how we can not only um apply this to our existing workforce as some of them transition mm -hmm. away from fossil uh, jobs and they want to be part of the clean energy workforce of the future as well. Other utility workers, uh, much like we do at the Northland Workforce Training Center, but maybe even more importantly, trying to trying to identify and attract younger people as they're trying to decide what career they want to pursue. So, can we work with uh, P Tech programs, high schools, community colleges, BOCES, high schools, trade schools? Yeah to try to 
try to um, do some programming around that to maybe attract those young people to the to the field. And as you know, we have a lot of P-Tech programming already and internships. So maybe um, building on some of that experience that we have to address those. So I think success will look like hitting as many of those, not all in, maybe in the first year, but over time, trying to hit all those different groups. Okay. I, I mean, it's just curious, you know, I've, lately I just read something about the combination of renewables and farming, right? And how that's changing some communities. So it, it, it's not all about urban issues. It's about how we're taking this money and this opportunity and leveraging it across many communities in New York. Right, I agree. And I, I think one of the things we're very mindful of is having some uh, geographic diversity around this programming, right? We've got a big footprint in Western right. New York. There's, a, there's obviously interest there. There's also a lot of interest, obviously, in the downstate region in New York City and in schools. So uh, trying to trying to apply some geographic diversity to that as well. Thank you. More to come. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, so as you know, this is just one um, piece of our, um, our vision and our strategy here. And um, before I turn it over to Eve Noel, our head of uh, corporate strategy, for a short update on Vision 2030 and our plan to refresh that, given all that's taking place, to refresh our, our strategy, which we launched in 2021. I just wanted to spend a couple minutes on talking about, because I think you've asked this question before around certain projects, and I think transmission was the context, but you know, how do we go about analyzing projects and making decisions? How, what's, our, what's sort of the NIPA mindset? So I want to just take, take you through a little bit of that quickly and then turn it over to Eve. So fundamentally, um, we make decisions founded on, on due diligence and strong process, but we think we go at it in maybe three different steps. First, we analyze and identify gaps. Second, we step in where needed, much like renewables, canals, uh, Indian Point, building the peakers, building the agri-power project. You know, that's, that's our DNA, that's, that's what we're good at. And third, um, how do we, after we decide where we're gonna step in, how do we implement efficiently what, we're, what we decided to do? And so how do we deploy our resources today? So you just think about the first, um, first uh, step, if you will, analyzing and identifying gaps. You know, we're, we, one of the ways we do that is we look, work closely with our state agency partners, we, we, we gather industry insights from what I would call the big three um, that we work with, EPRI, the Large Public Power Council, and the American Public Power Association. Those are our three big, um, I would say, industry um, resources. And then we have our own internal NIPE R&D, so Agile Lab, testing and deploying new technologies on our own, like our, our battery project in the North Country, and then, um, you know, externally, uh, the conferral process, which is new, but which is we're gathering a lot of information on the public hearings on renewables, uh, our efforts in workforce training, working with our partners in labor. So um, gathering those um, resources externally as well. And as I mentioned earlier, our new partnership with the Center for, Ener for the Energy Workforce, we're going to be working closely with them on the 25 million and our plans with, uh, with DOL. Next, uh, the, the next step would be um, we have to we gather information. Well, we step in where needed. So this is really the core, as I've said, of our of our sort of DNA. Um, we're we're obviously always uh, we're an R and D uh, organization. I think um, you know at it, at its core, and so we're always looking at at new ideas. The North Country Battery Demonstration Project, first state owned battery on the system, twenty megawatts. Um, we even have an out. We even have a battery uh, uh, pilot outside this building where we're testing um, uh, battery storage in in a densely populated, uh, in, you know, urban environment. So, looking ahead, you know, um, as we look forward to support the energy transition, we're continuing to look for uh, and identify gaps where we can step in and help the state accelerate. Uh, accelerate its progress toward the goals. So one of the things we could spotlight here as an, as an area where we're doing this is the, um, is the renewables effort where we're being asked to step in. And so our, sort of our initial thinking or 
um, the way we've kind of begun to um, identify what we're going to do out of the blocks, if you will, is we have about a, a thousand megawatts of fossil in our fleet. And over time, obviously under the CLCPA and under, under the, um, the new expanded authority, those assets are going to be retired. So, you know, how can we, how can we really move the needle? So we think at least at a minimum, we're going to build enough renewables to replace our fossil fleet over time. So it's sort of like, that's an area where we're comfortable stepping in. We think, you know, obviously we'll be monitoring how the private sector is doing, how the state's doing in, in, in uh, achieving its goals. But, um, but there's, that's an, a, per a perfect example of us sort of stepping in quickly uh, to address the state's, um, the state's challenges and the state's needs. And then finally, we have to implement all this efficiently. We've got to figure out, okay, now we've decided what to do. How do we do it well? And so one of the things we've been doing in, in this process is you know, we, we don't have a monopoly on great ideas here. And so we want to, we want to get the best learning and the best partners and the best, the best external um, support in order to make sure that we're implementing these um, responsibilities efficiently. And so one of the things we, we, we've, we've done is we've issued the RFQ, as I've talked about, which will allow us, once we pre-qualify those partners and investors, that'll allow us to move very quickly. If we identify a, a, a quick win project, we're gonna have everybody on board already. So we're gonna be able to move really quickly and implement that step in efficiently. And of, of course, this will all be informed by the refresh of our vision uh, 2030 strategy, which we're launching now. We've, we've spoken to you about, Eden Noel is gonna be heading up a refresh of that because like I said, that we started that process probably 2019, 2020, launched it in 2021. You know, a lot has changed on the, you know, COVID, the workforce front, the new renewables authority, energy landscape is changing, new technologies are coming coming to fruition. So we wanna make sure we're gathering all that and we're gonna come back to you with a refreshed vision right. 2030 strategy. And obviously we, we, we hope to um, bring you along and work with you and get input from you on how that strategy develops. I think before you pivot to that, I mean, this process, it's a drum, it'll be consistently, I think it's, you know, from a board standpoint, it's you know, boils down to resource all allocation and capacity building to ensure we're all the more disciplined and intentional about how we're allocating resources. Since the pulls and the demands are continuing mm -hmm. to grow, some controllable, some uncontrollable. Um, so how we do that and ensure that we're uh, at creating an, an organization that's elastic enough uh, to, to step into and has the capacity to deliver on this. So from our standpoint, I think that's a key that mm -hmm. we're looking to you in particular to ensure that we maintain that rigor and discipline and structure, if anything, all the more as, as we lean into these new uh, opportunities, because more and more people are quote unquote feeding at the trough of opportunity. And yeah, we, we have to be the adult in the room and ensure that we're appropriately triaging what's coming at us and making sure our resource allocation and the returns on those literal and figurative are uh, as beneficial right. as possible. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the things we're, we're actually focused on is, as we look at our internal resourcing and our capacity, you know, are there things that maybe we're, we don't need to do as much of anymore? Yeah. And can those, can some of those, uh, you know, people be reallocated. Where do we get better returns? Right. Sometimes you just have to make the hard decisions. Right. Can't do it all. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to be a key focus of the refresh and uh, we'll be work. I think we're going to have a, um, uh, a session with you on that. So we'll be definitely building in that, uh, that element of it. It's already, it's already front and center in our thinking yeah. around this, uh, we want to, I think over time, we want to build an internal capability, ideally, to meet the, the needs of the future. Right. And whether we can build that internal capability through repurposing existing uh, employees or bringing on new folks, or in the meantime, as you make that transition, leaning a little bit on external. But uh, our own operating model evolves. Right. To build that organizational muscle that will enable us that. 
to do a lot of that. And so. that's what, to, quite frankly, that's what will attract the, our workforce is, yeah. is the knowledge that they're going to be able to build a capability if they come work for us in a new and exciting field. Yeah, no question. Just okay. one final slide for me, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Eve. So uh, as you look at sort of the, the refresh, you know, how we're going to, how we're going to go about sort of, you sort of see the, the refresh and then the three, the three kind of steps that I've just taken you through. And then it's obviously socializing, executing, and then driving performance. Once we, once we all land on what we agree to be the new refreshed vision 2030 strategy, I think, I think as you've seen, you know, as we've, as we've driven the, the initial iteration of the strategy, this has become a key driver of our of our organizational performance. And we come to you at each meeting um, with status updates, and it'll be no different as we go forward. So um, it's an exciting time again to be here, and uh, we really look forward to um, uh, completing this 2024 process and then launching very aggressively 2025 this essentially new line of business for us and continuing to do all the other great work of the organization in transmission, customer, canals. Uh, so um, it'll be challenging, but I think, as I said before, I think the organization is really excited about the opportunity that, that we've been given here. So with that, if there are no other questions, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Eve. Just one before we lose you. Okay, Sorry, okay. one all more. Right. Yep. Um, with so much going on and you know status updates, which are really appreciated, I know that the Niper Reach comments are gonna close at the end of April. Um, so if we could make sure to have on the next agenda an update, but also, you know, summary of what those comments are and next steps, I think it would be super helpful, nice. not just for us, but for the public, just because you have cap and invest at the same time, like everything is happening. It's a lot, going on, it's yeah. a lot at the same time, but yeah. um, exciting. So that would be appreciated. Yep. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Eve. Thank you, Justin. Um, and in keeping with the theme of excitement, <laughs> um, NIPA is really excited about um, the strategy refresh process. Um, and how do I know that? Basically three things. One, we've seen increased participation. participation. We've seen increased attendance. Secondly, we've seen um, high engagement. People are coming to us with new ideas, bold ideas. And then finally, we've seen um, positive initial feedback. People are coming to us and asking about how do they get involved? How can, we, how can they contribute? So we know we're on the, the right foot and a right trajectory. Now the question is, what are they so excited about, right? <laughs> like, not only is there the mindset of you know, analyzing and analyzing the current state, stepping in where we need it and implementing efficiently, um, there is a five-step process that follows that same mindset, right? And we can go on and, and talk about the details, but I think where the key thing to note is that we're right here in step two, determining the market context and transitioning into a stage where we're doing idea generation. And um, what that really means is that we're consulting with internal and external experts in order to understand where we are right now and where we should be going. As illustrated in the next slide, um, we utilize a, a um, participatory model in doing this going for, um, in doing our stri strate strategy refresh. And what does that in involve? Um, it involves a structured conversation about the future. Um, so the, you see four examples of those conversations, first beginning with a canals visioning workshop. Two week, you're going to hear a lot of great things later on today about the canals program and operations. And two weeks ago, we had the canals visioning workshop. And in that workshop, we thought we, we got together with different departments within the canals and also within um, NIPA to talk about the role that canals, the, the role that canals will have in the future. And to that end, um, 
one of the more, more telling parts of that was that after the canal workshop, somebody from the canals team said that they appreciated the opportunity to come in and lift their heads out, out of the day to day in order to think about what's on the horizon. What are the different things that are coming um, and how they can have an outsized impact on the organization. Now, uh, I know that there is a lot there, but I think, don't worry, there's gonna be an opportunity for the trustees to also get involved. As you can see, there's a trustee trends workshop on April 24th. And within that trends workshop, which you can look forward to is a conversation about the supply and demand um, drivers in the energy market. Then you can look forward to the impact that these changes in the, on the energy market is having on New Yorkers, a discussion of that. And then finally, you can look forward to a conversation about how organizations are preparing themselves to respond to that, those changes. What I ask of each of the trustee members is to bring your fully engaged selves to these conversation. And it's the exact same ask that I have during all the workshops. Come, come engage, come with um, ideas to help shape the future. And that's okay. how we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. I mean, we have an existing plan. So give us a little bit more. So, you know, the visioning and all the rest of that, um, I'm, uh, you're, sure. I'm a little bit, I won't say confused, concerned, but we, we have a plan we're, that we're refreshing and yeah. enhancing, yeah. determining what's still relevant, what's <clears throat> missing, you know, as things have evolved. So, sure. I mean, that's the I, approach, right, that you're using, whether it's canals, customers, generation, whatever, right? Yes. To um, If I'm hearing you correctly, there's a concern about us straying too far against uh, away from where we we the good that we're doing. Next slide, please. And what and that makes sense. And what we're committed to doing is these three things. We're committed to leaning in where to accelerate renewables development in New York State. We're committed to preserving the value of hydro, which is the first priority in our in Vision 2030. And we're also committed to serving as a trusted energy advisor for our customer. And to specifically address your question about how do you make sure that you're not moving too far, like we're, all of this is anchored in our mission to, to lead the, tran the energy transition, right? Because all, all of our mission guides what we do. Is that address well, your question? I'm saying we've got, we have a, a strategy, we, we, have vision, vision we have a plan today. Yep. So I sit here and say, well, is that plan still relevant? Yep. So start with is 100% is of the plan still relevant, but there's so much sure. more to do. 70% uh, of the plan is still relevant. Let's throw out the other 30 that isn't and yep. supplement that. I, I mean, sure. there's there's an iterative process that we're going through here because, again, we're not starting <clears throat> with a clean sheet of paper. We're on a path on a course. So sure. I, I'm just trying to understand the nature of the process you're going through. Yeah. So... Um, to, to your, paraphrase your sort of response, your question, it's really around what's in and what's out. Like, what, what are we going to keep, right? Well, I'm just that trying to understand the process? the process. The process? I mean, the, 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 pro the visioning, we have a vision. I mean, we have a vision. We're building on our vision. We're enhancing our vision. We're, you know, we're expanding our vision, <clears throat> refining our vision. Part of this is things. I mean, so I, I'm just sure. trying to make sure I've got what your process is about. Yeah. And relative to what we have, as opposed to, well, we just woke up and we need to develop a strategy. No, yeah. we have, we've had one and we're executing. That's right. We have the strategy and we're executing. The way that I think about it is there, the strategy is made of seven components, right? Our mission, our vision, our mission, our values, our strategic priorities, and our strategic pillars. Our mission and our vision, mission, and values are not going to change. That we're anchored there and that's not going to change. What we're doing is raising our heads up and saying like, since 2021, as Justin mentioned, there's been a lot of change in the market. So consequently, are all our strategic priorities still important? Or have we, um, or, and a key factor in that is the progress that we've already made. We've done a substantial amount of work in our, for transmission mm -hmm. for the state. So are, is, is now a, a time to sort of say, hey, this is a lot of great work has done in, in transmission. Are we, how do we think about the other things that are gonna be on our plate? 
Like we talked, we started earlier today talking about the expanded authority and the role that renewables is going to place. So mission, vision, values, um, not going to change. Our strategic priorities and strategic pillars are open. And then the measures that we track against there are consequently open. To so what, what are we going to get in advance of the 24th? Or what are you going to, be, to provide us with? Uh, so... There is a, uh, the, the, on the 24th, we're talking about three things. And part of the thing, one of them is trends that are happening in the energy market. Like, let's look at sort of like the supply and demand. You know, we've seen there's been inflation. We've seen that there's been um, political polarization. Like, here are some facts and trends that we're going to provide you. And then, and that is going to be sort of your homework, if you will, to come prepared to talk about um, during the trustee training on the 24th. And in terms of where we stand relative to the existing plan, I mean, are you giving us an update on here's where we are relative to execution of Vision 2030 um, at this point in time? So, I mean, what, what else can we expect? So every month we sort of, we have our dashboard, which has the measures against our progress against each of the strategic priorities and pillars, and that's part of the information that we we give to you. Um, during the conversation on, during the trustee training, our focus is really more on the, the state of the New York market, well, the state of the energy market, which is both global and um, state statewide. Okay. And All right. Are there any other questions that anyone has? I'll just pick up on a thing that uh, Lori, was commenting on, it strikes me that we're, we're doing so much innovative, strategic work on renewable that there's an opportunity for us in the work that you're doing, and I know Justin, you and your team have started it, to help the citizens of New York State understand we're, we're, we're actually embarking on uh, uh, improving our transmission infrastructure, improving the grid at the same time that we're thinking about innovation and renewables, but we're sort of doing both of these twin uh, goals at the same time. So, so a little bit, it, it's exciting. But we also, in our messaging and how we think about it, because we're, we're the leader, we're in the middle of this transition. You know, there, it strikes me there's an opportunity to, to, to bring, bring citizens along on that journey. That the journey is not just about renewables. It's also, right. you know, deepening, improving our infrastructure, both transmissions, canals. Right. It's doing both of those things, and I'm trying to get that. I'm trying to get my mind around that. But there's a messaging opportunity there because um, often uninformed citizens just think you can wave your wand and we're going to be in the 22nd century. <laughs> we're not. I mean, it's a. It really is a transition. Maybe, maybe I would just add. I think it's. I think it's a. It's a great point, and um, it's one of the things that. First of all, I think we're we're well positioned as the largest owner and operator of the of the grid, but you know, as you think about it, um, we're going to need to continue to work on the transmission system, or the renewables that we build aren't going to be able to get 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 around the state, yeah. right? So uh, it's a big challenge, but you you need both. And luckily, there are other other players in the transmission upgrade, you know, business. Some of whom we partnered with, but uh, we we can't we can't let our uh, foot off the gas yes. on the transmission side either, right? Or we're not going to be able to move the renewables around the state. And and Laurie, so so the point you're saying, say, if we get through the conferral process, we have all this information, all this feedback. Yeah. You know, there's an opportunity to package that feedback with making that message. We, we're also driving to a better grid and a better transmission mm -hmm. system. And we're investing it. Yes. Billions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, I was amazed when I saw that there was a video that NIPA put out on Propel. I thought that was excellent. And I think the more that we can take those opportunities and talk to right. the public yeah. and explain what we're doing, because we are doing a lot, but then how all the pieces start to fit together will be really good. So just a shout out to the social media team, because um, that was really one surprising, but also really appreciated. Great. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Anything else you have, Eve? No, thank you. Okay. All right.
Well, we can use transmission to uh, pivot to uh, Joe and you can bring us current on the world of generation and transmission. Thank you, Chairman, trustees, members of the public and staff. Uh, good morning. I can go right to the next slide, please. I'm here to just give you an operational update. Um, uh, what I want to just represent here is, uh, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on. But we also generate and transmit electricity, right? So we're, we want to make sure that I'm assuring you here today that our team is still focused on the kinds of things that we do routinely uh, day to day to make sure that we're ready for the summer season as well. So our operational status right now is all we're in a number of different outages, either in transmission or generation that are designed to be done during the kind of shoulder months or we're not expecting, expecting polar vortices or heat waves. And uh, that's been a, a traditional way of looking at it. And um, as of now, everything's going as planned in these areas. But we are also focusing, continue to focus on the transmission perspective. Uh, actually, it's a technical compliance perspective. Our, our um, certification for as a transmission operator, TOP, they call for uh, through NERC. That's going to be important to us because that role has compliance obligations as we build new assets into the southeast region and even upstate, uh, for example, the stamp um, installation that's done in western New York would have some obligations for us in the TOP realm. So we're making sure that our from a, a compliance standpoint and a uh, governance standpoint that we're going to be and training standpoint that we're going to be ready for all of that. Also in Western New York, uh, folks who are familiar with the ice boom, that ice boom is out. So uh, we are now dragging that up into the Niagara River and our, our new staging area that we uh, did after relicensing of the Niagara Power Project uh, on the foot of Catherine Street in South Buffalo. So you still, we still have any ice this year? We didn't have any ice this year. Yeah. And it, I, that's actually uh, one of the, uh, the next talking points on G&T. Um, that's, that's good for, I mean, energy prices were de uh, depressed this year. Uh, I know Adam's going to talk about that, but the availability of water because of the ice issues in the, in the relatively mild winter that we had actually worked in our favor. So I know Adam was going to touch on that as a talking point as well, but yeah, we had no ice. It, it does, uh, um, bring into, uh, the, the discussion though, that the maintenance of the ice boom often is actually more expensive when there's no ice because it's not locked in place by the ice. So it gets bounced around a lot in these wind storms that we have and stations that we still have. Um, so often the, the cost of operating the ice boom actually increases when there's no ice, believe it or not. Um, another thing that we're working on is, uh, from a generation standpoint is our Flynn. We had a, a steam turbine, um, rotor issue. Uh, I think I mentioned that to you a couple of meetings ago. Uh, we had to wait for some supply issues that the rotor has now been delivered. Uh, we'll have some pictures for you next time. It's not this rotor that we're showing here, but there are some very cool pictures. If you're an engineer, I thought they were very cool. Um, so Joe, Joe, where's that new rotor from? Where, where... The Siemens. Siemens is the uh, is the manufacturer of that unit. So, and do uh, they make it in Europe or do they make it? Um, I don't recall where that one actually came from. I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that, where it actually came from. But yeah, it's, it's finally on site and ready to go. Um, again, I, I touched on the warm, uh, winter, uh, we are, even with all this though, we still always have a biannual, usually in the spring and in the fall, a winter preparedness session with our crisis management. And this time we're having a, a summer preparedness, preparedness that's scheduled for May 16th, an internal meeting with all stakeholders and IPA and canals to make sure that we're ready, uh, for whatever may come in, in the, uh, um, summertime. Um, and continue to uh, monitor weather patterns as well. Uh, you also may have heard there was actually a geomagnetic storm over the weekend. Um, we monitored all that with our partners at ECC and the New York ISO, no impacts to our infrastructure from that as well. So we're in good shape there. Um, we are finally, we're preparing uh, for the solar eclipse. A uh, lot of activity in this area, more than I ever <laughs> thought. Um, this is going to have a to uh, the path is going to have total uh, totality uh, right across in Western New York. Um, I suspect a lot of people will go into the southern states where it's warm and this happens, and the chance of it being sunny is better. But there's still likely to be an influx of people in Western New York. The state is preparing, and we've been a partner with uh, all of our state agencies to make sure we understand what that influx might be and how it impacts our operations. We don't believe, and we've been in communication with the New York ISO and others, that there's actually an operational implication. But in terms of a response and being available, we're going to give some guidance to our, cost, our, our, um, 
our customers and to our employees on to where they should be and what they should be doing in that area. So it's going to be mostly through Western New York and through Messina, but it'll be observable across most of the state. So we're just being very conscious of what their plans are for emergency response, keeping, you know, food, knowing that people who are not planning for this event will show up. And there are some iconic features in Western New York, like Niagara Falls, that people may want a shot of. And we know that there's very, uh, or even on a, a routine basis, very difficult to get in and out of that area. So we'll continue to work with them and their, our canals team and participating with whatever the state has in mind for us and give guidance to the employees uh, coming up that's forthcoming. Do we have official NIPA eclipse glasses? Or <laughs> we actually have a, no, we have. Well, or one thing so certified or whatever safety talking point is be careful where you get your eclipse classes on yeah, make sure yeah. they're properly certified but we'd have procured a number for our visitor centers and for our employees to make sure that they are on uh, hand for people who are going to take a peek yeah, at that okay, so yeah, so ahead. so we're ready for that um then just in general the uh, the portfolio of gnt uh you know we've talked about it a number of, of times but the supply chain issues and vendor issues that we've been encountering it's still we're still on pace though we're still holding up with uh with uh, the plan as uh originally planned for this year and so far so good in that area but just wanted to make sure you knew that uh, <coughs> kind of steady as we go on the on that piece of it so next slide please um every Every uh, few meetings, we like to rotate the topics from uh, operations. The, mo the most recent one here is going to be in custom solutions. You can go right to the next slide, please. And what the way we do this is try to illustrate to you um, by picking particular customers sometimes and just saying, like, what are the different things that we're doing with uh, these customers to show that aggregated approach that we have from uh, Maribel's team. Uh, so here we're showing that from the MTAs we're going to focus on today. Over 455 million is spent from the production of um, uh, and delivery of the uh, energy there. That has saved them $174 million um, uh, as compared to the tariff rates uh, that they would have uh, been um, charged. Um, and they are a significant customer. That 2,700 gigawatt hours is an enormous number. If you're not familiar with those kinds of magnitudes, that's that's a, that's an incredible number that they do. So uh, our programs, our, our contracts here are definitely um, supporting their operations and saving money. Uh, there as well. What's our largest? Who's our largest customer? They're probably our largest. Who well, says our New second? Or, oh, New York City. The New York City yeah, customers. Yeah, yeah. This is a single entity. They're probably the largest. Okay. Um, we also do energy efficiency projects. This is another area that we're able to do. There's some unique ones that they have an opportunity to uh, work on here. So, like this third rail remote heater system has some controls in place that uh, saves a ton of energy by not operating when when not necessary yes. and those kinds of things. And again, we always translate everything into um, um, from a greenhouse gas perspective into the uh, Terra BTUs to make sure that we're comparing uh, apples to apples when we do these things. And we have five pro projects in uh, progress with them right now in the energy efficiency arena as well. Everything from uh, uh, solar panel uh, audits to, uh, again, these rail switch heaters for controls and um, just more traditional things that you would, you would think of for our energy services in terms of lighting and, and HVAC upgrades as well. Um, and then uh, e-mobility, uh, I think we touched on that a little bit already, but we're helping electrify their entire fleet uh, to meet the 100% zero emission fleet by 2040. Uh, so for bus charging, there are two main phases underway. Uh, phase one has 67 chargers across five locations. Um, in 18 at one location are operational today and construction is ongoing in the other four locations as we speak. And uh, for phase two, um, a total of 470 chargers across 11 locations support businesses, buses arriving in uh, 25 and 26. Uh, so there's a procurement of the buses that goes along with this infrastructure that uh, they're working on as well. So just to, again, kind of show you the multi-pronged approach that in particular one customer that uh, the customer solutions team is uh, uh, working on with um, with our major customers. Next slide, please. Uh, Justin touched on this a little bit um, earlier. This is part of our uh, enacted uh, state budget, our responsibilities, uh, where we're engaging with 15 leading state entities to develop decarbonization plans. Uh, again, as the trusted advisor, we're trying to make sure that we're um, implementing uh, these decarbonization plans to have a collective potential to reduce greenhouse gas in these facilities by 30%. Um, <clears throat> we use, again, TB, uh, TBTU, uh, uh, Terra uh, BTUs for a proxy for greenhouse gas. Um, and if you look at this list, what you see is really is five of the six largest state agencies that make up the, the, this DL program that we're uh, working very closely with. Um, all 15 staff level customer information kickoffs have been um, 
completed. Uh, the award memo for service providers is fully executed and two decarbonization plan service providers and one program manager have been selected. Uh, scope includes data collection right now, plan development, installation um, of pilot geothermal wells, and the team is developing data collection templates and working on uh, onboarding the service providers. So on-site kickoffs will take place in the third quarter of 24. We'll be definitely keeping you up to speed as uh, we continue to move these, these forward as well. So uh, the combined uh, greenhouse gas potential, they selected 15 is 34.1% requirement um, where the requirement was 30% uh, reduction. So if we accomplish this, we're going to, we're going to exceed our, our goals here. Are we doing this show to supplement what they're otherwise doing, or are we doing this because they weren't doing anything? I mean, no, they were, they, most of our customers have plans. So this was an idea to kind of just rally everybody together and aggregate this and, and actually give a, give our subject matter experts an opportunity to review their plans, provide them a master plan. So if you can think of the university system as an example, every campus had some order of plan with their facilities group on what mm -hmm. they should be doing. The goal here is to see if we, what if we can aggregate and have economies of scale and supporting the okay. decarbonization of the entire SUNY system. And that's similar to most of the facilities. Our individual facilities in our energy services department, we're always working with them on some of these things. This is just in a way to accelerate through this plan, uh, some of those plans and be give, uh, give them a master plan to, to, to think about going and it's forward. it's been embraced by all of these? It agencies. has been, it has been, yeah. I think it's been, you know, a it's lot of- given us the stuff each, 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 No, I, I think a lot of, you know, each facility has had ideas originally. So there's always that, you know, you know this was our plan originally. So we're, we're able to reconcile that our customer um, um, key account team and, and the customer social team is very good at uh, really just engaging them. And we're really, we're supporting their master plan. In the end, what they're going to do is, is execute uh, and leverage that to, to, to execute their own plan. So that's the idea is just to accelerate it, grow it, um, give it scale. And, and Joe, this, sure. uh, by the way, this is a fantastic program. This is outstanding. It strikes me. There's a framework here for our state uh, hospital systems uh, private universities, you know, major users of uh, of energy and power, but the framework that you're using for, say, the SUNY system could have applicability across the states. So, yeah, it won't stop here. It yeah. won't stop here. These are these, we're going to do a lot of learning here and how this is done, how we're able to aggregate this, how we can work with each one of these uh, uh, partners. Uh, but it won't stop here. There's going to be well, other we opportunities. Can, that's what I was going to go to. We can cascade this across. And, and, yeah, and we already are. I mean, it's almost impossible not to translate some of this into what we're doing already with some smaller customers that wouldn't be in this this large list list of large users. Uh, so we're already translating some of those competencies through our project development team and, and um, uh, energy services team to do that. Yeah, I just want to put a plug in for the big hospital systems in the state who are huge. Writing energy. it down. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the final slide for my presentation. And if, unless there's any other questions. Anything else for Joe? Good job. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks very much, thank you. Joe. Under Joe's auspices is uh, the world of canals. And uh, said so we were all up in Brockport six short months ago. And uh, Rebecca and Brian and Dave and Angela and team gave us, uh, uh, yeah, a wonderful day. and. Uh, incredible learnings that we all still benefit from. So on a semi-annual basis, at least want to make sure we get a refresh and an update. So Rebecca and team, go Thank to you. it. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Board of Trustees. Uh, welcome members of the public, both in person and virtually. We're happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hughes. I'm the Executive Deputy Director of the Canal Corporation. Um, and as the chairman said, I'm here to provide this semi-annual update. Um, I'll be very quick and just kind of set the stage for my colleagues, Angela and Dave, who will provide the more substantive updates. Um, but first, I just wanted to touch on a few developments since we last met. Uh, so in Governor Hochul's State of the State Address, she established the Erie Canal Bicentennial Commission. So this is a really important step for the state of New York, embracing this uh, milestone of the Erie Canal's 200th birthday. Um, as Angeline will detail, there's many, many events and celebrations planned in coordination with communities and many opportunities for the board and for the public to come out and join us in commemorating this milestone. Uh, she also had several items in the state budget for Canal Corporation. This is 
huge in and of itself because we're now establishing a line within the state budget for canals capital programming, something that hasn't happened since about 1991. Um, so in the executive budget, she included a line item for $50 million in funding for canal capital improvements. I'll talk in just a minute about how we're going to be prioritizing that. Um, she also included 1.5 million for numeric modeling, which I'll also touch upon in a bit more detail um, with regards to the upstate flood mitigation task force that we executed last year. Um, and she's been very, very vocal about this. I included um, you know, a very stark quote from a speech that she gave at Monroe Community College. Um, she's very much invested in preserving the state's history and ensuring that it remains safe and operable for the people of New York State. So we're very happy to have her support in this way. And our hope is that this becomes a recurring commitment for canals and investing the much needed capital in the infrastructure. And Dave will expound on that. Next slide, please. I have more than a hope. I have an expectation that it will become <laughs> an increasingly yeah. uh, recurring. So. And I think in order to make this a recurring commitment, it's really important that we focus on prioritization. You heard all of the different competing priorities that NIPA is facing. The market is changing in an unprecedented way. And Canals is inextricably linked to that. We are a commitment you know, for the power authority at a time when we're doing a lot to advance the clean energy economy. So with this $50 million, um, which is included in both one house bills, it's not final until the budget's passed. So I should note that, um, but with strong bipartisan support and support from both houses, um, we've been talking um, you know, about this in very consistent terms. We're prioritizing our investments based on risk. And this is a, a Dave Mellon uh, education I received, which is risk equals probability times expected value. So simply put, we can look at the general condition rating um, and the consequences of a failure. And that's how we prioritize with limited resources. 50 million seems very big to me. Um, it is just the starting point and we need to be very deliberate in how we're investing that money in order to reduce, reduce risk at the portfolio level. Um, and this is a little bit of foreshadowing for what you'll hear from Dave as well. And next slide, please. And my final slide, just diving a little bit into the 1.5 million that is uh, earmarked for numerical modeling of several watersheds that have been subject to um, recurring flooding events, the Mohawk and Oswego River basins. Uh, back in July of 2022, Canal Corporation was tasked as the chair of the Upstate Flood Mitigation Task Force. Uh, we took that mandate very, very seriously. We convened a group per legislation that reviewed um, historic documentation of the financial and other impacts of flooding in these flood prone watersheds. We produced a set of recommendations that were then published in July of 2023. And we'll soon meet per legislation. We have a requirement to meet annually and update the public. We have so many great updates. So just a little preview of that. The 1.5 million will allow us to create numeric um, models of these watersheds so that we can look at as we make other interventions, how effective might they be in mitigating the impacts of flooding? Um, we've also secured several FEMA grants under their Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program that will allow us to study other aspects of flood mitigation and will allow us to bring uh, that work to 60% design so that we can then use it to do benefit cost analysis. Again, limited resources, where can we invest and make the most impact and in this case, I take this very personally, where can we help to mitigate impacts of flooding for those communities that have felt it over and over and over again? Um, and this will be a combination, not just infrastructure, but zoning, property buyouts, which are something that the governor's also made big commitments to. So I'm excited for this progress and it feels like we've got a lot of momentum behind us right now. Um, so I'll pause for any questions and uh, then I'll turn it over to Angelin. Thank All right. You. Good kickoff. Thank you. Hearing none, Angela and Chandler. Hello, I'm Angela and Chandler, the Vice President of Planning, leading the Reimagine the Canals Initiative. Next slide. So we're now in our second year of the Erie Canal Artist in Residence Program. In 2023, 
Our artist was Matthew Lopez Jensen, an artist based in the Bronx, and he focused on maintenance on the canal system. He visited all of our maintenance shops and every lock in the system. He now has an exhibit of his residency work on display at the Erie Canal Museum. And he's working on publishing a book um, next year for our bicentennial of his residency work. Uh, this year, we have three artists. Uh, we, and they're all working in photography. We felt that there's still a lot of people who are not aware of the canal and that photography would be the best medium uh, to convey this awareness. So uh, our first artist is Judith German Hines and she's based in Kingston and she is uh, photographing women whose work is associated with the canal. So um, she has already contacted a lot of our um, women canal staff and they're very excited about this opportunity to sit, to sit for a portrait. Alain Capel is an artist based in Catskill, New York, and he's doing what is called re-photography. He's visited the Erie Canal Museum and their archive and selected a series of historic photos of the canal. And he's going back to those same spots and photo re-photographing them today to see what has changed over time. And our third artist is Clara Riedlinger, and she's based in Rochester. And she is very interested in religion and the canal. So you may be aware that Mormonism and other religions developed along the canal corridor. She's going to be photographing the historic and current traces of those religions uh, in the canal landscape today. We're very excited about this low cost, high impact program that is attracting a lot of new constituents <clears throat> to our canal system and is showing all of us new ways um, to look at the canal. Next, please. And, and um, excuse me, Angela, before you leave that slide, um, this is a fabulous program. Yeah, this great. Is a, I mean, for us to spotlight this national, actually a global treasure, this is a fabulous program. Uh, as you look forward, um, I was reading some of the history of the canals. The, the New York indigenous population were very involved in building the canals. Back in the old days when they used mules, <laughs> shovels and all this. Uh, as you think about your roster of artists and residents going forward, if there's an indigenous artist uh, and, you know, there's multiple tribes who were involved, that would be something that uh, would, would, you know, I would completely agree. To you. Yeah. Absolutely. So to, to that point, there is a program that the Erie Canal um, Museum put together in Syracuse around the history of beading using um, a representative from the Seneca tribe. Yeah. And she talked about how the beading work that they were selling at the opening of the canal and when Niagara Falls became a tourist attraction can be found all over the world. Yeah. So, so that's one little tidbit of a program that's already out there that you could tap into to begin to tell us that part of our story. Thank you. Next slide, please. Great, so under the banner of the Governor's Bicentennial Commission, and we have a lot planned for the next few years. <coughs> and we invite you to participate in our commemoration of the Canals Bicentennial with us. We will of course be part of the planning um, and uh, for the World Canals Conference, which will take place in fall of 2025. Um, we have just kicked off a partnership. This is very exciting with WMHT, the Connect Capital Region PBS affiliate to produce a new documentary about the Erie Canal. Uh, they lasted one in 2017. Um, and this one will air in 10 short segments throughout 2025 and will be wrapped up in a one hour program that will air at the Canals Conference, the, so the World Canals Conference. Um, and this is a forward looking um, uh, approach to documenting the canal. Um, on the consent agenda today is um, a contract with the Albany Symphony Orchestra with whom we will partner for the planning of concerts and events for the next three years, beginning this year. Uh, these concerts will be forward looking and will be themed around more voices. They will feature emerging and underrepresented um, composers and artists. Uh, the Albany Symphony Orchestra will partner with regional arts institutions and educational organizations. Uh, and we aim to host a number of these events in canal <clears throat> venues. 
We are planning a series of bicentennial forums, um, and our first is occurring on April 10th at Monroe Community College and will focus on accessible recreation. The state's chief disability officer will be our keynote speaker. And finally, we're developing a new planning document for the canal that looks forward 25 years to 2050. Uh, we're creating this plan in close coordination with the Canal Recreation Way Commission that builds on their visionary plan um, that they um, uh, developed in 1995. Next slide. Uh, as you may recall, the Brockport Pedestrian Bridge was one of the first five projects announced um, under Reimagine in 2020. We're on track for completion at the end of this year. Steel will start to um, arrive at the site in May, and we're hoping to have a steel signing event in June, and you will absolutely be invited to participate in that event. Next slide. Um, Medina, this is a great project um, that talks about uh, reimagines <clears throat> alignment with the canal's infrastructure needs. Our work in Medina will make significant improvements to the trail and waterfront park and the concrete canal high wall. Uh, we're in 60% design on that project now. Um, and we've received a $2.64 million grant from the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation for those at work. The image here was taken at a ribbon cutting event last fall. Uh, for a public sculpture created by the um, students in the School of Architecture at the University of Buffalo. Um, and this is uh, a place where um, students can gather uh, and play and take selfies. So it's very important <laughs> to them, take selfies. Um, but this is the first step uh, of our work in Medina. We're also in conversations with a prominent Western New York arts institution about um, implementing a, a landscape art project uh, on a canal a site that's just adjacent to the sculpture um, that was formerly used for leased out for cement processing. So we hope to come back to you um, with more information on that and other arts related efforts um, here in Medina. So stay tuned. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dave Mellon, for an update on operations. Thanks, Angel. And when we met with Wilson, they were very excited and very enthused about you know, the Medina and the project. It was great. Morning, everyone, trustees, members of the public, colleagues. So I'm going to give a brief operational update. Um, if you go back to October, mid-October of last year, the, sea, the navigation scene that season ended and then we begin our winter work program, okay? The non-navigation season. So this is the time where we can do a little bit more invasive maintenance work, okay? There's uh, the locks don't have to operate and so on and so forth. And this is a work effort that involves probably, you know, a little over 400 of our 500 some employees that we have in the winter months, including about 60 seasonals. Um, I mean, high level, the, the uh, weather was uh, pretty mild this year. So the productivity, I feel, is up a little. Uh, work sites were generally a little bit safer than typical. Harsh conditions, we did not have to fight. Uh, so from a productivity work perspective, feeling really good about where we are and looking forward to the season. Next slide. So there's really, there's too much to say on what we did with all, with all 400 employees across the state. There's too much. Um, so I've got some highlights here just to give you a sense of the kind of work we've been, do, we've been doing. Uh, the lock work, okay? So the pump out program. So we take eight locks across the state. We dewater the locks entirely. And we have a crew of approximately 15 to 20 people there for this entire time period. And they're doing the maintenance they can based on their, their capacity, their expertise. It falls short of capital level repairs, but it's heavy maintenance, I would say. So we do that at eight locks across the state. Uh, the, you know, when we switch slide, when we go to the next slide, don't do that yet, but we've got a nice video. Don't go back. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we have a nice video, a drone video of an active pump out at lock E10. That's a nice bird's eye view. Give you a real real good look at some of the challenges that we're facing. Tell us again how many locks there are, Dave. It's eight or nine out of 
57. 57. <clears throat> so every lock we can typically get to every eight to 10 years or so. And so then we fake, we go to, you know, our floating plant crews. We've got four floating plant crews across the state, a lot of UDS during the work, UDS work, upland disposal site during the winter months. So that is basically emptying sediment from these upland disposal sites, bringing it somewhere, either beneficial use choice, working with collaboratively with DEC or uh, to a landfill. Um, or manipulating the cells within the UDS so we can more efficiently utilize it uh, for this upcoming season. So I'm basically making room for our dredging program. <laughs> a lot of that work, uh, guard gates, lift bridges, a lot of repair work underway. Albion and Brockport, two big uh, rehabilitation projects in collaboration with DOT, just about wrapping up the summer. Uh, vegetation work at many locations, which will allow us to do a better job inspecting these assets, their water impounding assets. Well, we can do a better job inspecting them. We can see the seepage better. Uh, so that work underway. Waterford Machine Shop, well, that is, uh, that's basically a hub for the entire canal system in terms of parts. So, so many parts go with these assets. They're all unique and historical. You can't go to and you can't go anywhere, Home Depot or can't go to your hardware store. Can't, can't do that. <laughs> so they're really manufacturing, and we're really making some progress um, upgrading that machine shop with modernized, automated equipment that can really uh, produce these parts a lot more efficiently. So that's in project in progress, and then some facility work as well. Okay, so if we, if Eric, if you could go to the next slide, this is a. Block E10 in Cranesville, New York, between Amsterdam and Schenectady, active pump out. Joe Maloney, our Eastern Region Canal Engineer, kind of narrating here. Um, and you'll, it's, it speaks for itself. And uh, we, we can have a, a little Q&A after this, if, if you want. We're here at Lock 10 for our annual winter pump out in the Fonda section. The lock is located adjacent to the Mohawk River and connected to the movable dam that's associated with this lock. This is our second year here at this location. Uh, we're probably looking at a third year at this location, largely due to the condition of the concrete and the wear and tear that this lock has seen over the years. One of the biggest problems we've run into at this lock with uh, coming back multiple years now is the condition of the concrete. Every time we start grinding away concrete to find a new anchor for replacing some steel or anchor bolts, we end up realizing that we're, we're grinding for a foot, foot and a half, two feet, and we can't find competent concrete. In the trash rack we installed last year, you'll see that it doesn't fit flush with the concrete wall. The reason is all of that concrete was ground out with no competent concrete still found behind to anchor into. We ended up having to box out that trash rack and create a, a structure all out of steel just to fit that in because there was no good reliable concrete for us to anchor anything into. Right now, we've got Atlantic Testing is on site collecting concrete cores, part of our analysis of just how bad the problem is here. Is can we identify specific locations that need work or is this more widespread at the entire location? Some of the preliminary coring work that we've done is already revealing that we have extensive problems with the concrete aggregate at the site. A lot of the aggregate is really just rounded rock and it's not crushed stone, which would provide greater strength and quality of the concrete. In addition to the aggregate, we're seeing problems with the concrete matrix itself and the, and the cement that was used. There just seems to be large inconsistencies of really good quality cement and really low quality cement. One of the concerns we have on this lock is the amount of concrete repair work that's necessary. It, it's requiring twice as much maintenance for us to even do the normal repair work that we would typically do just because of the concrete conditions. This lock is a good example of the challenges we face across the canal system for the condition of the infrastructure that we have and the capital projects that lay ahead of us. Any questions before I move on? What's the cost of that particular effort? <clears throat> what we're doing or what's needed? Or what we're doing. <laughs> uh, that's probably a, a million dollars worth of work. And what was not now versus what's needed? Probably 40. I was gonna say, I remember you told yeah. us 35, 37. For one yeah. Lock. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this goes like there's probably uh, three or four locks in worse condition in other places across the system than this one. Um, and just for perspective, it is not in good condition. However, the thickness of those walls at the bottom 
uh, is probably as wide as this room, if not a little wider. So it's a battered wall, you know, then it comes up like this. So there's a lot of concrete in these walls. And the first, you know, two, three feet needs some, some extensive work. But it's no nobody is feeling that it's going to fall down. Nothing's going to implode, literally. <laughs> right. That's that's a good. That's good yeah, to thank know. You. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So next slide. Okay. Okay. So our workforce, uh, PEF and CSEA contracts are behind us now. Thank you everyone for the support on those. Uh, better or increased salary rates very helpful to our hiring process. Uh, and some provisions that'll help us operationally. The title consolidation and the training programs go together. This is in progress. There's four stages. Uh, two of four stages are behind us. And this, this is the overall effort is basically expanding the potential duties of any canal worker, okay? So they can do anything we need them to do you know, generally, but we have the responsibility to train them so they can do it safely. So the two things work hand in hand. That's coming along. We hope to implement stage three later this year. Um, we internally, we got to an agreement to convert uh, some seasonal winter positions to permanent positions. So typically in the winter, we hire about 65, 60 to 65 seasonal employees who assist with these pump outs. Um, so we're gonna convert, I think just under 50 of those to permanent positions. So what that'll do in the future is that in the future winter work programs, um, we will only have a very small, if any, contingency of seasonal assistance. And the permanent workers uh, will have, you know, they'll have more longevity, they'll retain the knowledge through the training that we give them, and it'll just be a better return on the investment for us. So uh, the New York HELPS program, so that acronym is Hiring for Emergency Limited Placement Statewide. New York State Civil Service put this in place in January of this year, and it basically uh, eliminates the competitive exam for entry-level workers and pretty much subjects it to min quals only. So another thing that's come out of the state that's going to be helpful, hopefully, in hiring um, for this summer. Uh, Canals HR and NIPA HR are working together, uh, visiting many places, trying to drum up interest for the summer seasonal workforce that we're right on the cusp of getting ready to hire that workforce. And that's gonna be probably just shy of 200 workers is the goal. Next slide. Okay, so lastly, this is the last slide. Um, this season I think is gonna look largely the same as, as prior seasons, particularly like the lowered water levels in the Western Erie, the 60 and 17 mile pools, increased monitoring, seepage concerns, keep the water about a foot low. But the, the rest of the items there are a little new for this season. They're not stark in, in terms of causing concerns, but uh, we are looking at the schedule, the open hours of the system. Uh, the standard hours right now are seven to five, and based upon uh, metrics that we have, we see in a lot of locations very low usage from seven to eight in the morning. And we hear people saying, uh, when I get home from work, I'd like to go out on my boat. So, right. mm -hmm. you know, nothing's going to happen there without the appropriate stakeholder engagement, obviously. But we are looking at things uh, like that uh, to alter the open schedule this year. Uh, our permits, we have over 4,500 permits uh, annually. Um, and all that, all those transactions are taken care of uh, with paper billing and checks mailed to a bank. So it's, it's archaic, um, <laughs> needs to be improved. And we're hoping uh, there's a software system known as Excel that we hope to have in place by the fall of this year that will basically make it all fully automated typical, you know, like, like you go anywhere else and you can take care of your bill online and communicate through that portal. So looking forward to that, uh, water management, we finally have our water management team in place fully. We've got a, a fully dedicated hydrologist now facing canals, uh, looking to create a, a dashboard um, for the organization relative to water. Uh, so people can see the good and the bad instantaneously. So that's in progress. And then the last thing goes to the 50 million in the future. Uh, and that is 
basically NIPA project management and canal operations working very closely to make sure we're ready to spend this money and basically deliver a larger program as we look ahead. So, terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great work. Do you, um, Dave, do you anticipate the low water levels to continue? Is that because of the water coming from the Great Lakes? No, it's a, uh, let's just say that this room is the canal, okay? okay? And the water is up to the ceiling, okay? okay? That's the normal elevation. Well, under that condition, we, we have like, for example, in the 60 mile pool, we've got 274 known points of seepage. Um, good man. Okay, and some are wet and some are not, but there's a whole history on each leak per se. But we have found that when we lower the water, even marginally, that many more seeps are dry versus wet, which is a good thing relative to public safety. So it's trying to strike the right balance to, to, to have the seepage be at a place where we can manage it. Yeah. And are we managing the messaging on that, Dave, in terms of constituents and user groups and those who would complain that the water's too low? I mean, the communication, we're progressively stepping into how we notify, advise, inform. Yeah, this will be our third season of that. And uh, the message is relatively simple. It's communicated through our Notice to Mariner system. And it, there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, when it, when it was new, there were questions and concerns. It seems to have settled a little. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, appreciate it, Rebecca. Uh, Angela and Dave, thanks very much for Thank your you. continuing good work. And uh, we look forward to an exciting, warm season and, and even more excitement in 2025 for sure. So thanks very much for your time and good work. All right, uh, we need to fund a little bit of that and a few other uh, items. Uh, so Adam, the floor is yours. I guess it's good afternoon, trustees and <laughs> Thank you members for that. of NIPA staff and members of the public. Is that like hurry up? In. Is that like <laughs> hurry up? Running late? I just what wanted to, that? you know, to recognize. That mark the, the fact that we're past 12, so. But staying on schedule. Um, Says so you're supposed to be done at 11.58. Okay. <laughs> I'm just letting you know what my cheat sheet says. Karen says you're late. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll try any to catch questions? up. We'll try any to catch up. Any other questions for Adam? <laughs> well, we did have a good conversation this morning at the audit committee, and we Hopefully we've now put 2023 to bed uh, as we turn to 2024. As I mentioned at the last uh, meeting, um, first two months of the year, we are uh, tracking on or ahead of schedule in, in most areas. Uh, February was much like uh, January. And as, as Joe mentioned, uh, the, the prices are depressed, uh, offset somewhat by our hedging program, which is good thing that we have that in place and that uh but generation has has run ahead so we've been able to produce more and generate more so we've uh that's more than offset uh, what we're seeing on on the on the prices and we'll see if that holds throughout the rest of the year um transmissions a little bit behind we'll talk a little bit more about that um, mostly related to htp uh not doing as well as it was scheduled uh, based on uh, last year's performance um and the non-utility revenues slightly behind, but that's more of a timing issue as the energy efficiency projects uh, get underway and get going. We are confident that'll that'll catch up. Uh, operating expenses are in line, um, you know, running a little behind. Uh, I would, um, you know, just note on the allocation of capital. Uh, while this was in your materials, the list of all the different projects and where they are, uh, none in red, most of those in green. We spoke about the ones that are in yellow, uh, but you can also look at that allocation to capital number as it just as an indicator as to whether or not uh, projects are proceeding on plan. If it's a little bit behind, it means we're a little behind. So um, it, when all else fails, that's a good indicator for you to measure how well we're doing on the capital plan execution. Uh, interest, uh, non-interest expense and uh, other items there, mark to market was a negative mark. Uh, you know, some of that is a result of 
the bond markets um, sold off somewhat. Uh, you know, the economy continues to run at a very good clip. Uh, the last two inflation prints were, I would say, stickier than uh, people were expecting or wanted. You know, it's not that it's going up, but um, I would say sticky is probably the right word. Uh, so, uh, while the market might have been expecting a March move, uh, the Fed did not. Uh, now people are saying, or handicapping, maybe that happens in June. So people are saying maybe higher for longer on interest rates, mm -hmm. maybe three moves instead of what was thought about maybe four or five. So people have sort of downgraded that to a certain extent. But you know, other economic indicators in terms of employment are still low. So uh, consumption is still doing well. So the economy seems to be going very strongly and people are really looking at either a soft landing or no landing. So uh, the you know, recession word is not really being used in today's um, speak. So uh, you know, that's what's going on more macro level. Um, but that's the first two months. We go to the uh, end of year projections. Uh, those we're, we're keeping at, at this moment right on, um, on schedule, on target. I think we'll be doing some work between now and the next time we meet to really do a deep dive and refresh those projections if needed. Um, but I would say today, if I had to you know, put money on it, it's, we're leaning more towards you know, doing better than uh, the risk of doing uh, below plan. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, so we see things moving in the right direction and at least uh, in making plan, um, certainly at the minimum. Any questions? So, so far so good, too yep. early to... Deviate and you've yeah I, we're gonna we're sufficiently gonna, sandbag the plan that you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well I'll talk a little bit about it. so the next slide is was sort of a, I'll put it in the category of sort of a regulatory win for us as a team here um, and, and the reason behind that is really um, you know given the nature of our business and how much it's changed over the last few years. You know, this idea of cost allocation is very important because a lot of that re, um, turns into how those costs are then recovered through revenues, whether it be from cost of service customers, other rate payers, <coughs> transmission um, rate payers, which is the entire, the entire state or other uh, profit centers that we have. So cost allocation is, is a very important issue. Um, up until... Uh, you know, now the way we've done that. So we have about $250 million of general costs that um, are not identified to one particular area at any one time. So that has to get allocated out towards all the different profit centers and entities. And the way that's been done has been using a labor ratio, which is really just looking at labor hours and using that as a basis of coming up with those percentages. Um, given the way, the material way our business has changed, given the massive investment in transmission, both capital, people, you know, what we spend our time on every day uh, has taken up more and more of the activities of the organization. So the question really was, um, is that cost allocation method still the most relevant and ensuring that all the different, whether different classes of rate payers, different profit centers are getting their fair share? So we don't want to have a situation where people are being overcharged or under recovered. So the result of that is that we came uh, with a um, proposal that we submitted to FERC, which is to implement something called a modified uh, Massachusetts formula. And instead of just looking at labor as the only causation uh, effect on costs, uh, looking at uh, other items like net plant investment and revenues and taking a three factor formula and applying that. We call it modified because we do exclude certain pass-through costs that would otherwise skew those results. But the result of that is it's gonna, uh, which we just got the order on March 15th signed by FERC. And it was a very you know, in-depth uh, study looking at all the issues I just <clears throat> mentioned to make sure that we're fairly allocating costs. And their conclusion was that uh, this is the better method for us to make sure that we're appropriately recovering the costs we should be for our transmission activities, as well as not overcharging other areas within NIPA. So the result of that uh, will be coming back and we'll make an, a, an adjustment to our target, but we do believe that there'll be somewhat of a one-time catch-up, which I would say is a non-cash accounting 
item, but on an ongoing basis, we will see a uh, an increase in revenues as it relates to our transmission revenues based on the change to the cost allocation method. Um, a lot of a lot of engagement with various stakeholders. There was an intervening group, you know, the uh, MUA and. A lot of discussions with them and everybody came to a very reasonable uh, settlement conclusion that this is the right way to go. So this is just a better way to allocate the an existing pool of costs Correct. or this enables us to allocate more costs? Well, it's how we allocate the pool of costs. So, so overhead allocation for lack of a better sure. phrase, right? That's sure. what we're allocating. Yes. It's a more equitable way to allocate that. Correct. And the favorable benefit to us is driven by what then? That instead of, let's say, 30% being allocated to transmission previously, right now the number will be more like 39%. Okay. So that, uh, that piece that will be now allocated will be part of our revenue base and we'll get additional revenues. Yeah. As a result of that, there may be some offset because some of our cost <clears throat> of service rate payers uh, may be paying less than they would have uh, before. So, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off there, but net net, it's, it's gonna be positive to our revenues going forward okay. for, in total. So I'll, we will come back because our rate year <clears throat> for the transmission starts in June uh, 1st. So it will be uh, looking at what that uh, true up is and what the new revenue requirements gonna be. So by the time we meet in uh, May, we'll have some updates for you and we'll update our our forecast for the end of the year accordingly. So it's not the modified New York State formula, it's right. the modified Massachusetts. Right. Okay. Yeah, so if anybody gets upset, you can blame Massachusetts, Massachusetts not New York. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. and, and, and Adam, with this new future state formula, you don't have to get New York State ISO to approve it. It's the FERC, FERC, FERC is the operating. Yes, FERC, FERC makes all those decisions. So we have other things that we may be going to them for, and filings, you know, such as, you know, which, what's the right return on equity we should be getting and things of that nature. And there's other things that come up from time to time that we pursue, but they are the final arbiter of all those issues. And uh, like I said, they do a very thorough job, but the team did a great job. Uh, good help from Lori and, and the legal staff uh, supporting all the, uh, um, the uh, FP&A controllers group, budgets group, you know, everybody working together because again, the, these things get looked at very uh, seriously, but given the fact that it is, uh, uh, has an, a positive impact and, it, and also an equity impact, it was important that we get it right. Anything else for Adam? He's otherwise eight minutes into his five minute presentation. So we're a little further into the afternoon. <laughs> Anything you. else you have? No. Nope. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, Adam. Very well done as always. All right, uh, Alexis, uh, a little bit of a risk update. So hello, trustees, colleagues and members of the public. Over the course of the next hour, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. You who recall though that in February, we had a holistic overview of our comprehensive and collaborative risk and resiliency processes. As part of that, we presented the complete set of NIPA and canals enterprise level risks for the first time. Those are only updated en masse twice a year and considering that we didn't have a particular item to escalate to you today, which is a very good thing, we are choosing now in these off months to spotlight one of the risks to give you a little more information behind it. For today, um, we have chosen third party risk. Uh, we're hearing a lot about in the news, some supply chain issues, and we thought this might be an item of particular interest. Looking at this, um, we'll start here on the left-hand side of the graphic. Um, Chairman, I hope you will note the rotation of the graph and well you're not having yeah. to lean out of your chair well to read done. it this time. Um, you can see the positioning of third-party risk and we're choosing it specifically because notwithstanding some of the concerns we've been reading about, NIPA over the course of the past year had taken many steps to help us to mitigate, be aware of and manage through some of the supply chain issues. So you will see, the risk score actually has improved from being just in the red zone at a score of about 16 and has reduced to about eight and into the green zone. 
it's really uh, actually really good results. Um, and what I was primarily about is trying to decrease the likelihood of risks associated with third parties coming to fruition. The key components that you'll also see now on the right hand side, that's our, our speedometer to show you how that risk fares against our risk appetite. The risk appetite's the little, the little blue bar underneath the red, amber, green arc at the top. And you will see that we've also um, seen an improvement more deeply into the green or well-managed zone. Um, our risk appetite, it is act we're actually doing better than our risk appetite. So that's a positive thing. And it actually means that we have, we have some wiggle room. We have some wiggle room. Um, we don't have to be too much on alert. Some of the key factors that contributed to the progress over the course of the year, um, there were actually several. One was in general, we had a big, push across the organization to update and align our business continuity plans. That was beneficial, not just to the operational areas of the organization, but also to our um, SSM group and their, their oversight of third-party risk management. We have also um, overall reviewed and mapped over 70 underlying operational risks that feed up into this third-party overarching enterprise risk. And that was working again together risk team, our strategic supply chain management organization, and also internal business controls. So a second shout out to IBC today for their good partnership in working together to see how we identify risks and help to put the appropriate controls in place. So um, in addition to that, the risk team continuously monitors metrics, both internal and external. Some key ones related to third parties include um, RFPs with multiple responses. And we also look externally at the global supply chain pressure index. Interestingly, those metrics remain mostly stable over the course of the year. So we do keep our eye on it. And if there are some fluctuations, it might cause us to have more internal conversations about potential additional steps. A really important one too is um, emerging risk. So we mentioned that these overarching um, profiles get updated twice a year, but we actually have a weekly resilience call in place across NIPA and canals where we have subject matter experts from all different areas across the business who come together for a brief hit call to understand what are some you know, news items, what are we experiencing, any changes to the conditions of our operating assets and how we're looking at at um, operating going forward and bringing that together rather holistically. So um, very specifically, we've been spending some time talking about the potential impact of the situation in the Panama Canal. The water level's low, it's impacting some supply chain, but our SSM organization has been utilizing their emerging risk process, staying on top of that to help continuously analyze any of the potential impacts and actually proactively reach out to some of the vendors to see if they're having impacts so that we have awareness. So a really important piece of that as well. SSM also has enhanced their vendor oversight mechanisms with some new software tools that help them to boost monitoring and scoring. And they did that for over 2000 open vendor contracts. So that was again, a lot of focus on their controls and their risk mitigation improvements. With that, we were able to actually see and, and actually respond when the um, I-95 highway collapse happened in the Philadelphia area. And so our SSM team was actually um, in, in communication with about more than 60 impacted vendors to see how that would impact NYPA. Just in general, if we were to look at how these different elements come together, we bring them together really on a weekly basis besides updating the risk scores. It's helping us to stay on top. The most important components of your risk process will be that you have information that gives you input into your decision-making before it's too late. And that is what we've been experiencing through the supply chain issues we've experienced, which have actually kept us in a pretty good position. We will continue to monitor that going forward. Of course, conditions can always change, but um, we were able to end the year showing really good progress in terms of mitigating controls. So just to clarify, we're not saying the level of third party risk has diminished it's it, the, like the absolute like level. It's our ability to, to manage it manage and mitigate through. it has been improved. Correct, yes. It's around 
trying to reduce the likelihood that we'll have the worst case scenario financial impact to the as business. As a result of ever increasing third party. As a result of ever increasing. External yes. risks that are beyond our control continue to increase every exactly. day. Would see. Yes, that is true. Um, what we can do though is to, to maintain our level of awareness mm -hmm. so that we can put in place controls where we do have the ability to have an impact. And that is in terms of staying in contact with our vendors, having um, multiple, multiple vendors we can source to. This SSM group will look at various factors um, based on current situations. Okay. But the full scope of third-party risk is broader than just supply chain and vendor management it is it's true which is why there are about 70 underlying operational oh, risks okay. that yeah that's why it takes us some time to do these comprehensive mm -hmm. um overarching enterprise risks and do so twice a year we could give a drill down we can give some more information on some of the underlying risks if that would be interesting to the trustees always feel free to share you know okay. send mm -hmm. a follow up okay sure. questions Good. on that topic no no and then we had just one last slide, and that was just a really quick overview um, because, again, in February, we gave a, a status update kind of where we're at now. This was just a really brief overview of some of the areas for risk, resilience, and sustainability that we're looking to focus on over the course of the upcoming year. Um, so last month, again, we talked about our risk maturity. We talked about our risk snapshots. Um, this very month, we actually had NIPA's first ever resiliency forum, where we brought together different areas of the organization that were focused on different areas of resiliency, everything from business continuity plans to how we're looking at climate adaptation, workforce resiliency, brought them all together for a day to talk about what are some of the focus areas, what really does resiliency mean within their perspective of the business, and then look at some of the opportunities that we have going forward to help elevate and improve our resilience stance. That was a really nice accomplishment. Over the next few quarters, we'll be looking to take our next steps in terms of emerging risk. So I mentioned some of that horizon scanning, the weekly resilience calls, those are really good foundational components, but we're actually getting uh, working with an external um, support consultant to help us get a more outside in view about what are best and good practices for NIPA and canals to consider. Um, our risk appetite refresh, we've noted a few times that NIPA and canals do have very different business models. So we'll be looking to refresh our risk appetite, but we'll also keep in mind whether there's any divergence in the level of appetite we have for different risks across those two business areas. Really good to ask the question. It may or may not be the case. And um, from a sustainability perspective, we were looking, um, taking further steps around our climate adaptation areas a focus, a uh, study of the Great Lakes and how climate may be impacting that by mid-year, um, really important to help us um, think about next steps for our generation forecasts. And then um, an integrated report, which we had for the first time last year. And right now we are in the process of preparing for our second annual publication. Hmm. Very good. Quick flyby, but those are the big hits. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Yeah, we took the committee meeting that would have been in February and <laughs> yes. rolled it into full board in yes. effect. So, okay. Good. Thank Any you. Any other questions for Alexis? Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks you. very much. All right. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, what three committee reports coming out of three committee meetings. Uh, since we were uh, last together a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were together as a finance committee. And from that, uh, we've got a handful of, I guess, four technical, technically four items, uh, and one uh, resolution. A uh, quick little refresher here as to what we all recommended. We uh, approve as a full board. Uh, one was the quarterly release of 27 million to uh, continue to subsidize uh, canal uh, operations. Uh, another was uh, a transfer of $10 million from the operating fund uh, to the state's general fund in support of state energy programs. Uh, third was uh, amendment to a modification of the East Garden City substation development agreement 
and uh, the release of an initial $50 million to uh, support uh, that project. And uh, the last was uh, to approve the execution of the Propel New York Development Agreement with the New York ISO. So unless anyone wants to revisit any of those topics, I would uh, be pleased to entertain a motion to adopt uh, those items. Thank you, Dennis. Michael, second. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. We uh, had, uh, as always, an exciting uh, audit committee meeting uh, this morning. Oh, so <laughs> Dennis, that you very ably shared. If you'd like to recap aye. that sure for us, thank you very much. You're still, now you're going. Oh, all right. So the audit committee met uh, this morning, as John said, and adopted the minutes from the December 12, 2023 audit committee meeting. Uh, the committee also received the report from Angela Gonzalez on the 2023 internal audit plan update. The following four items are now before the NYPA trustees and the New York State Canal Corporation's board of directors for adoption. The items before the trustees for adoption are one, the approval and adoption of the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation's 2024 internal audit plan. Two, the approval and adoption of the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation's 2024 environmental health and safety compliance audit plan. Three, approval and adoption of the procurement contract, audit and accountant services contract award. And four, 2023 financial reports pursuant to section 2800 of the public authorities law and regulations of the office of the state controller. Unless anybody else wants to come and uh, talk about these things right now, I ask for a motion to adopt these. <laughs> uh, well, I'll ask for the motion. I'll take your motion as a motion. So I have a second for second. Dennis's motion. Lewis, Don't thank prove. you very much. Uh, yeah, unless anyone wants to embellish on the robust dialogue we had <laughs> earlier this morning. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. One item we didn't uh, bring forward in a formal motion, but I'll acknowledge here is uh, our uh, internal auditor, lead internal auditor, director of internal audit, Angela Gonzalez, is uh, stepping down and stepping away from the organization. She was acknowledged there for her incredible service and leadership over the last uh, seven, eight years, and uh, reaffirm that again in public session for all of us. So, Angela, thank you very much for a job very well done. Uh, and then, uh, Governance Committee, uh, Chairman B, yes. Chairperson B. Yes, Excuse so me. it's okay. The Governance Committee met on March 12th. Um, we adopted minutes, received three staff reports, and adopted seven consent items, which are now before the board for adoption. And these are procurement and related reports for New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation, January through December 23, report of procurement contracts and open procurement service contracts, guidelines and procedures for the disposal and acquisition of real property and report for the disposal and acquisition <clears throat> of real property, certain policies for New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation, the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation 2023 annual board evaluation, guidelines for the investment of funds and 2023 annual report on investment of authority funds, and the report on New York Power Authority's 2024 mission statement and strategic plan, which totaled over 840 pages. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any questions <laughs> to be put forth regarding this motion? Otherwise, I'd ask for a second for B's motion. Second. All right. All right. There's second, third, and fourth in there. Karen, I'll start it out. Uh, <laughs> All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carried. Thank you very much, uh, B and Dennis, for your leadership. Uh, next up on the uh, agenda, we have a little update from uh, Lori Alessio on uh, our real estate. And Thank you, Chairman, trustees, NIPA employees, and members of the general public. As you know, um, NIPA has been exploring real estate options in the White Plains area for over about a year. 
in um, November 2023, we received some responses um, and we reviewed those responses. We put a team together. We also interviewed the developers to better understand the projects and we are now um, ready to proceed to the next step, Chair. So we are, Great. I'm here looking for your concurrence and the board's concurrence to move forward to the next stage and uh, enter into some more pointed negotiations um, with the finalists. And we will clearly report back to the board about the progress that we, that we make with those negotiations. There's a lot of positive activity. All I have to do is look All out the positive. window. I'm trying to be quick. I'm, yeah. I'm last on no. the agenda. I'm saying positive activities. We look out the window. Yeah, so yeah, it's excited great. Excited to be a part of yep. that. So. Yep. And it's, you know, we have some improvements to make with the garage. So we are excited about next steps. The opportunities for super. Yep. Plus, anyone has any questions for Lori at this point? I'd ask for a motion to duly authorize the further dialogue. And So moved. All right. Thanks, B. Second, Dennis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Any you very opposed? Much. Thank you very much. Negotiate on. Thank you. <laughs> Bring it home. <laughs> Bring it home. Uh, the consent agenda. Um, number of items uh, included here. Uh, and uh, when I was reviewing this, I asked uh, Justin, I said, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, economic development, I feel it's just a key a component of what we do. So we don't want to understate the impacts, uh, you know, that we're having with a lot of the programs and the initiatives. And Keith Hayes used to dazzle us with his uh, uh, presentation. So I thought, you know, opportune time, Buffalo stuff, Western New York stuff always catches my eye. But obviously Global Foundries here, significant uh, impacts for the state and a key economic driver. So thought we'd take a couple minutes before we pr approve the uh, consent agenda agenda just to highlight uh, some key initiatives and projects there. Is that? Yeah, you're right. You're right, Chairman. We've kind of fallen out of the habit of <clears throat> highlighting some of the uh, awards. And of course, the economic development uh, authority that we have here is a key part of our activities and such an important, we're such an important tool in the state's toolbox in terms of promoting economic development. And so uh, it's always good to highlight uh, some successes. And so I've asked Maribel Cruz to uh, speak to a couple of the items on the agenda today. Okay, great. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, Maribel. Yes, great. Great to see you all. Good afternoon. I'll be very uh, uh, quick, knowing that uh, we're, we're running low on time, but I do appreciate the opportunity. Well, good to news. Highlight. It's always good to you know, good news. take your time yeah. with good news. Right? Excellent. Yeah, I, I have some observations that I think this entire organization will be very proud of. So we this month, we do have a diverse number of applications, not only in terms of the size of the of the customers and the applicants that have come to us, the types of industries that are being represented, but also the diversity of the programs that they're looking for support in. So this month alone, we have activity in seven of the 10 regional economic development councils across the state. That's terrific. We make it a point to be as uh, out there, our Exclusive. folks are out All there. Right. That's right, that's right. Um, and, and just a quick reminder, each of the applicants is evaluated for their job uh, commitments, their capital investments, um, their use of electricity and how significant that is to their operations, their alignment with the regional economic development plans. But those are just a few of the criteria. There are 12 that are mandated by statute that are our guide as we administer and we manage these, these programs. So just want to recall those 12 criteria that we evaluate by. Um, we do have customers that as rated individually may be below the portfolio average, but when you compare them by industry, they rank very high. So just a quick example of that, we may look at food production can be very high jobs per megawatt, but the hydrogen industry, very energy intensive consumers, but not a lot of jobs associated with those processes. So there you'll see some diversity right. in, in that portfolio as well. So very proud that today's recommendations uh, contribute over $5 billion in additional uh, capital investment. So the numbers jumped off the page and I was reviewing the materials, no <laughs> question. Agreed. With billion with a B. It, and, yeah. and it just continues to rise. And so I keep smiling because, you know, there are some challenges that we're all facing, right? Big projects, but there continues to be such a steady stream of applicants 
coming for power. You know, a steady stream of businesses trying to locate and real, you know, expand <coughs> in New York State. So all very positive. Um, over 9,000 jobs, over 1.1, you know, close to $1.1 million in proceeds awards. So that's exciting. And then over 120 megawatts in power allocations. So I just want to highlight three, you know, one power proceeds uh, recommendation that's in front of you today is for the Niagara Arts and Culture Center. They're looking to rehab this facility to expand its use in the community. Um, they have some HVAC issues. The system is over 100 years old. There's very poor air, air filtration. So as you can tell, the community may not use it as much as it could. So that $1 million proceeds award will help them rehab that facility as well as increase handicap accessibility in the community. So very positive news there. You mentioned Global Foundries. You know, Global um, Foundries has been a customer of ours. You know, their leadership came to us with an adjustment to their original application. Uh, not only did they, you know, talk about the, the new work that's going on in their auto project, but also an increased project, which they call the FAB project. But overall, they have increased their capital investment to close to six billion dollars in that, you know, that that company alone in that that facility in Malta, um, and over nine hundred and eighty jobs and commitments. So overall, we we work with the customers in understanding their latest dynamics, their reaction to supply chain issues and what commitments they will continue to retain in New York State. Um, and as we know, you know, Global Foundries is like, you know, the chips, the semiconductor, you know, industry is something that's incredibly important, especially, especially at the federal level. Um, it, it coincides with the Federal U.S. Chips and Science Act. So we're very proud to be able to support that industry in New York State. The last highlight for today is one that brings a smile to all of our faces, Buffalo Games, a puzzle manufacturer. <laughs> um, they happen to have a facility in New York State, but also another one in Massachusetts. They will be moving right. some of their operations into the Buffalo site, so causing for an expansion there. Yeah, no, we're always proud of that one. Right? <laughs> right. It right. gets great visibility exactly. in, in the community. Yes, indeed. So the good news is that they're increasing their puzzle manufacturing by over 6 million units annually um, and adding another six to 700 puzzle items. So, you know, maybe we should uh, contact them about a NIPA uh, puzzle, right? I, I, or exactly. something like a canals puzzle. We need yes. a canals puzzle. So, That's right. Yeah. That's right. So that concludes my quick picture. zippy uh, overview of the good news in economic development. Well, kudos uh, said it's a key, key, key driver for what we do, why we do what we do yeah. is to enhance and leverage uh, what we bring for the benefit of uh, all constituents. So thank you for a little bit of recap. Anything else? Any other questions for Maribel on those or anything else that you saw in the materials? Otherwise, uh, I'd ask for a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda. So moved. so moved. Thank you, B and I'll Cecily. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. And uh, unless there's anything else to come before us, uh, well, I've lost my page. I think that concludes uh, our agenda and our uh, meeting for today. We're next back together in another uh, 60 days, plus or minus. We've got a finance committee meeting uh, in between. And uh, by then, the Mets and the Yankees are first in first place, right? So we'll be able to, we'll be able to we'll, yeah, it's early, right? But you got to get them early. So, all right. Thanks very much, everyone, for uh, spending your morning and portion of your afternoon with us. Uh, have a great day uh, and enjoy a wonderful holiday in the week ahead. And thanks very much. We'll see you soon. Uh, motion you. to adjourn. Thank you. Move, second, all in favor, aye. Thank you.